because you're jumping back into the gut. All right, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media on Twitter at Bball Immersion or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is outstanding today to have Coach Lenny Akoff with us. Coach just completed his first year at Lipscomb where he took over a completely new roster and guided the team to the Atlantic Sun Conference Championship final and uh, 16 wins were the most by first year head coach in Lipscomb's Division I era and most of us know Coach Akoff because he spent 22 seasons at the University of Alabama in Huntsville where he built the program into a national power and uh, Coach I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Well, just tremendous. And, uh, you know, I, I know like like many uh, coaches, I have a lot of your notes from over the years. So I have a lot of questions, but uh, let, we're going to dive into a little bit of the art of coaching. And uh, let's start, Coach, with uh, why do you coach? Well, you know, I, I think that's an, uh, hopefully for all of us, and it's an evolving philosophy. Um, when I got into this, Chris, out of college at 23, I I got into coaching because I, I honestly, I, I had a great passion for the game. I, I could never imagine being away from it. But, um, but as I've, you know, as my career has progressed and, you know, was, I just finished my 30th year as a head coach in college, my perspective has changed. I, and, and I'm thankful. I, I feel like if we look at life, you know, in, in your fifties, the same way you did it in your twenties, you've probably wasted the last 30 years of your life. And so I've tried to, create a little bit better perspective on it. And, and really at the end of the day is try to uh, affect and have some type of positive influence on young kids. And I, I really, that that's at the end of the day, what I try to do, I try to help kids and uh, help the guys that work with us to, to try to be the best version of themselves, because as you and I both know, and I know there's a lot of coach speak that goes with this, but it's probably more relevant now than any time in the world. There's so many life lessons that go with being a part of a team and having to fight through adversity. And so at the end of the day, that's kind of where I've landed. I just wanted to have a chance to impact people. Well, and clearly you have, and uh, it leads us to kind of this topic, which I know we're going to, or I guess every podcast, we kind of somewhat talk about the art and the science of coaching, but uh, let's get your perspective on the art of coaching. What does that mean to you? Well, you know, it's honestly like most things that, that I've kind of adopted into our philosophy or things that I've learned, I've learned from other people. And a dear friend of mine was Kevin, still Kevin Stallings. It was the basketball coach at Vanderbilt for a long time and finished up at Pittsburgh. And he said something to me one time that made so much sense. He said, you know, everybody talks about the importance of what are we going to do on offense? What are we going to do on defense? He said, probably at the end of the day, I think that's probably, you know, your schematic ability, your ability to teach is, you know, 15 to 20 percent of our job, he said, probably the other to 80 to 85 percent is actually the art of coaching. And it made so much sense to me because I, I remember my, my son is a baseball player and, um, and I, 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 I did play baseball. I was decent and I liked it, but I, that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I always tell people when I coach my son's baseball team, I, I'm I'm just I know just enough to be dangerous. And I think that's where a lot of people land in coaching. But. I said, if your son or daughter chooses to be a part of our team, I said, I am not a great teacher of baseball, but I think I can coach baseball. And I said, I feel like I can help them with their mindset and ability to compete and, and all the things that go with that. But so I think I think probably 15 to 20 percent is our ability to teach and the other 80 to 85 percent, which I think gives you a, the ability to pass the test of time in coaching is probably the art of coaching. And really, at the end of the day, it's how you deal with people. Absolutely. And relationships and and all those things that you've talked about. And for me, so much of it comes back to, and and I think people kind of sometimes think I'm very rigid with what I think, but I I think the art of coaching is best described by kind of how you said it by saying it depends, like it depends, doesn't it? So much of what the art part of it is that even though you believe something and let's get an example out here, you ran the Princeton offense for a long time and then you decided to shift away from it. And yep. that is the art of coaching because no, that, it depends. It, Can you talk about it, that shift? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's no right or wrong. I mean, it, it's the end of the, <laughs> it, 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 at the end of the day, it's not what we do, it's how we do it. And, and, and for us, like 
you know, what, what happened, and, and I know you've had Jimmy till I've been so fortunate, you know, I, I told you, I've shared some notes that I think the closest thing to a shortcut in coaching is having the right mentors. And uh, I was so blessed. I, I had the chance to coach Jimmy Tillett's son when Jimmy was at Sanford. He, his son Tristan played for me. And so I saw Jimmy install the Princeton offense. And the more I'd go watch, and, you know, Jimmy was probably the first guy that got inside kind of the, the Princeton bubble. And he was the first guy I felt like that really knew how to teach it. And the more I saw it, I watched what he did. I said, I think we can do that. I thought it fit our situation at Huntsville. And we were really fortunate. We had a lot of good teams and a lot of success. But I think the longer you are somewhere, particularly if you have maybe an outlying philosophy or style of play, there becomes a think tank on how to sabotage that. There becomes a think tank within the within your league. Like I mean, I, I, a lot of people ask me about the difference in Division One, Division Two. We can get into all that, but like, there's really, really good coaches at every level. And the longer we ran the Princeton offense, I felt like this team would do something that bothered us. And obviously it's my job to figure out how to combat that. But then the next team would ask something and, you know, people talk. And so I felt like for us, we we would do really well outside the league. It was really problematic for people to guard us outside the league because they didn't see it very much. But when we got in our league, we at times would have a really hard time scoring. And, you know, you, I, I feel very strongly about this. And, again, there's no right or wrong. But I, I will always say it is an extremely hard game when you can't score. I mean, I, 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 when you can't get the ball to go on the goal, it really is difficult. So we just started figuring out different ways to play. And we've never totally gone away from some of the concepts of the Princeton. But it's, it's not necessarily our staple anymore. Take a brief moment to interrupt this podcast to share some information from one of our show supporters. As sports keep coming back, so does your chance to bet on them with our exclusive wagering partner, betonline.ag. Major League Baseball will soon be in full swing, and there are no shortage of ways to get in on the action. BetOnline has all the odds, futures, and props for you to be on. Also tune in as Floyd Money Mayweather Weather joins BetOnline team in a new segment called the ice is right, where he talks about his expansive jewelry collection. He'll give you the chance to win some great prizes and bet on the cost of his bling. Visit betonline.ag today to check out all the odds and up-to-date sports news. Don't forget to sign up and take advantage of all the welcome back to sports bonuses. Bet online, your online wagering experts. Now back to the podcast. Well, just a tremendous example, again, of what we talked about with the art of coaching. And uh, I love that you said this. And can you talk about this a little bit more about how a mentor is a shortcut to becoming a better coach? And probably, as you say, the only one. Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's so important. You know, it, it, and I think when you think about a mentor, it's someone that really has your best interest at heart. You know, when, when, when someone talks to you, do they care enough about you to tell you the truth? And again, there's so many ways to tell people the truth. I think it's really important that we're tremendously honest and transparent with our our players. But but you have to have the ability to know when I sit down with someone and I've got a handful of guys that when I'm in a bind or I don't feel good about where we are with our team or I'm really struggling, I know when I call them, I feel like they have the ability to help me and they they have my best interest at heart. And so I've been really fortunate to have that. And, and I think, too, you also have to know that you, there, you can't you can do anything you want. You just can't do everything you want. Like you look for me, Chris, I'm coaching at Lipscomb University and, and I feel very strongly the greatest teacher of the game of basketball, particularly from a fundamental standpoint and the best teacher of teachers was Don Meyer. I, 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 I just think his legacy and and just and, and I, I coach Meyer actually recruited me a little bit out of high school. I had three high school teammates play on uh, two high school teammates play on their national championship team. And and then I coached against Coach Meyer. I can't tell you the impact and his willingness to help me, what it's meant for me and my growth as a coach. Well, you're not the only one that feels that way about Coach Meyer and uh, the academies. And that was my first connection with Lipscomb was driving down for one of those academies he put on and just a tremendous experience with that, too. And uh, Coach, maybe not talking about Division One and Division Two, but maybe just talking about the process for you 
and it would help coaches understand about moving jobs. And can you talk about that? Like why, why move jobs? What are some of the things that factor into that? And uh, even for taking a job for some of the coaches that haven't yet taken their first head coaching job. Yeah. You know, I, I think that if when we, I think you want to make sure, you know, Chris, for us, I think like everything in life is fit, you know, like you said, it, 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 it's, there's no right or wrong, but what, where do you think you fit? Where, where are your beliefs, your philosophy? Um, where, do, where are they in best alignment with where you work? And, but, but I do think the hardest thing to do is to get head coaching experience. I think it's the hardest thing to get on your resume. And so I think part of that is, is having self-awareness and saying, okay, where do I fit into this grand scheme of coaching? And if you have a pedigree of being a great player, playing at a higher level, uh, it's probably a little easier if you're, you know, your dad was a coach or you've been in around it your whole life. You probably have a run and start at that, as you and I know. But I, I think a lot of times I, I hear young guys say, well, I don't you can't win there. I don't want to take that job. You know, I, I just really think there's no better way to learn than being a head coach. I, I just think that I mean, I, that was like I, I, I shudder now when I took my first job 30 years ago, like I had no clue what I was doing, but man, I was going to work really hard at it. And that job to me was like being the head coach at Duke. I mean, like it was everything for me. And, you know, I, I think it doesn't matter where you coach. It matters why you coach and why you do it. But, but for us, I, I think there are three things you need to ask yourself before you take a head coaching job. You know, first thing is, can you and your family survive financially? I mean, I, I think one of the quickest ways to sabotage your career is put yourself in a situation if you have a family to take them where it's just going to be impossible to survive from a financial standpoint because that adds stress that you just can't overcome. I think the second thing is, can, can you live there? Is that somewhere like I, I think I or we – and obviously it's a lot easier if you're single, but I have seen a lot of coaches – shortcut their career or get into a bad spot in their career because they end up moving somewhere they really have no interest in being and they're looking to get on the first ship out. I mean, there's 12 months in a year. You coach basketball about 30 nights a year. That's your games. And then, you know, and then the other thing is, can we have enough success to for, for, for me to be able to survive, keep my job, and then can I advance? And, and I think a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, Coach, Coach Meyer, you say, can you finish in the top four in your league? Um, because cause at the end of the day, winning is really, really, really hard. I mean, I don't care where you coach, winning is hard. Every situation is different. And, and I think you need to be able to look at that situation and say, okay, can I go in there and have an opportunity to be in the top four? Because there's just certain jobs, the bottom line is you're not going to win in. I mean, you know, you, I, I say this all the time. You, you don't, you don't fix, fix a flat tire by changing the driver. I mean, there's a reason some jobs just don't work. But if you sometimes maybe if you pull back a few layers, maybe you may be the guy that can make it work. And sometimes that's how you make your mark. But, you know, for me, moving from Huntsville, where I was very, very, very happy, that was home for me. Um, and taking a job like at Lipscomb, you know, for me, it was something I always dreamed of having a chance to be a division one head basketball coach. But in no way was it the end all. I, I would have been more than uh, fine and happy to finish my career in division two. But I thought it was a chance for me to do it at a higher level in a place that their values and the way they wanted to do things aligned with the way I saw. Tremendous, tremendous insight into that process. And uh, another phrasing that I love, and there's so many phrases I love that you use, but one of them is coach from the community to the floor. Can you expand on that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a I'm from Alabama, and, and when I was growing up, uh, you know, that's when Coach Bryant was at Alabama coaching football, and you know, and I and I'm older probably than most people that listen to this, and you know, they used to be in the old days, you just you coached your sport, and basically your job security was based on whether or not you could win or lose. I mean, you, if you won, you stayed; if you lost, it probably didn't work out. But the ability to be community minded, big picture minded, was not really the um, most important thing is just you coach from the floor to the community. I think now the way things are in our society and, and with social media and so many other things that go on, I think you have to build your groundswell from the community to the floor. Like I, I think if you don't have the ability to build support outside your building, if you don't have the ability to build support within your building, it, it, at some point, your your excellence as a coach on the floor is going to run out 
because if you don't have the ability to cultivate the right people behind you, it's just, you have a shelf life. And, but if your groundswell is really good in the community and you have the right people that are saying good things about you, that because you've invested in them and those relationships, I, I just think your chance to, to have time to do it the way you want to do it goes way up as opposed to you going there and saying, this is the way we're doing it. I don't care who stands in my way. I don't care what I have to do. And you go in there with like a Mack truck. Eventually, you're going to run that off the road, I feel like. Uh, and it's, it's such a great point. Great perspective to be able to approach things from that way. And, uh, you know, it's it's led to you obviously having consistent success. So can you talk about some of the things that uh, I guess let's start with you go into a new program and you do a needs assessment. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, you know, I always think whenever you, and we we do it on a yearly basis, but particularly when you take the job, I think it's really important to under-promise and over-deliver. And, and I think the way you do that is you, when you go in, we're slow to speak, we're quick to listen. And then what we need to do is we need to look at, okay, what do we need to have in place to win here versus what do we have in place? And, and I think for us, I think that's getting a lay of the land, a lay of the, getting, a, getting the pulse of your league. Who do you have to beat to win your league? What does that look like? And then once you figure out what we have versus what we need, then you have to put a plan in place to, make, to, to try to close that gap. And, and like for me, the, most jobs, when you take them, either there's been a lot of success, long, and, and a lot of times when there is tremendous success, there's a long standing line of success and you go in and you just need to kind of keep the ship moving in the right direction. Or it's a job that there has not been success and they're welcoming change. You know, they said, look, we need to completely do a 180. I think those jobs are easier than taking over successful jobs. And please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying this to be self-promoting. I think the third way is the way we took over this job is Casey Alexander was a coach here and Casey did an unbelievable job. He's now the head coach at Belmont. He is a fantastic coach and a really good friend of mine. I have so much respect for him. But when, when we took over this job, you know, they'd been to the finals of the NIT. They'd been to the NCAA tournament the year before. They had had a school record for wins, but it was a situation where we lost 7,700 points. 7,700 points and over 3,000 rebounds. So it, it, even though there had been a, there, they had been tremendously successful, it was basically a re- reboot of the roster. And so, I mean, that was difficult. And, and I, please understand, I say that with total, um, giving him complete credit of what he did here. It's just, it was an outlier situation. A kid transferred after we got here. We had two kids graduated early. So it just, if he would have stayed, it would look a little bit different. So trying to pick up the pieces and continue to have success when really the roster has been completely turned upside down. So um, that was different. And so for us, we needed to try to figure out how to just get the plane landed the first year. Well, and you did, and you got it landed near the end of the year where obviously you made the championship final and the team certainly had its ups and downs. But uh, do you feel like you got it? to the place that you wanted to in your first year to be able to continue the success of this program? Yeah, you know, I, I really felt like, and, and I mean, we can talk about staff and all that, but but I thought the guys that worked for me, um, Roger Eastern, Kevin Carroll, Tyler Murray, and Daniel Harris, the job they did with our guys of just staying the course was incredible. Um, we were look, we were sitting at the end of January, we were in set, we were seven and 13th and we were in eighth place in our league. And we're able to win nine of our last 10 and, and finish third in the league and, you know, lost to Liberty in the finals of the conference tournament. And I feel like there was some defining moments in our season where we didn't flinch. Um, I felt like we kept the matches, matches consistent. We tried to stay positive and we just tried to every day just keep kicking the can down the road a little bit. And I do feel like the last month gave us a great deal of credibility. We, like everyone, were very disappointed when all – the pandemic hit because we were really excited about the spring and summer to build on that momentum. We had eight freshmen on our roster and our leading score was a sophomore and our second leading score was a fresh freshman. And so we felt like, and I always think your biggest jump goes from year one to year two is just as far as the ability to see fruit. I don't know what that'll look like going forward because I was really proud of our guys. And, and I felt like as much as anything, we, we got some equity and some credibility in what we were selling. 
Well, it's going to be exciting to see and uh, see how it goes. And there, another thing is that traditionally in Huntsville that you would redshirt freshmen, right? And then you didn't yeah. have that luxury to do that. But is that something moving forward that you believe that the at Lipscomb, that's something you want to continue to do? I sure would like to. And, and now it's a little bit of a different dynamic when you're recruiting at Division One. Most kids don't want to go to Division – most kids that have the chance to play Division One would probably – they don't want to sign up for that unless you're at a really – you know, somewhere that – you know, if I say, well, I can go to Duke, Carolina, or Kansas, I have to redshirt, they'd probably do that. Right. But I, I thought for us, I thought for us, Chris, it was what separated us. I thought it was the best thing we did over my 22 years there because basically we gave every kid a sabbatical. Like what we would do, we would take that kid that was a little underdeveloped but was really skilled or a kid that just needed one more year of just being in the weight room and to be able to refine one skill set. And, and, and we would take that year and we just said, look, this, you, you don't even need to worry about playing. This is all about your development. And then also having the ability to get them familiar with our system. And, and one thing we talk a lot about that, that I feel very strongly about is you should all, I think if you're going to have a longstanding program, your mindset ought to be coach next year's team this year is if you're going to be there a while and you feel like this is, I'm digging my heels in here and I want to be here. You even you're busting your tail every day to have the best team you can have, but never forgetting there's going to be a next year. And, you know, we, we talk about growing kids in the weeds and that's what we felt like we had, because if, if we're on the road recruiting, you'll sit down by somebody and they'll say, well, you know, how many starters do you have back and who did you recruit? Well, sometimes the most important people are the kids that have been in your program. Like those are the guys you need to grow in the weeds. And then you need to, and, and you, you and I can think of programs every year. You're like, I didn't even know that kid was there. And he ends up being an all conference player. And you go to find out he was like the ninth guy the year before. So I think it's so important that you keep a long-term vision with well, having short-term goals. Well, and absolutely. And you've done that and you'll continue to do that, no doubt, at, at Lipscomb. And coach, maybe another thing that I, I've, I've seen in your notes, and I, I really like this, but I'm, my question might approach it from a different perspective. Is part of forming culture, knowing and pointing out what is not us as much as it is what is us? Absolutely. And you know, that was Coach Myers' thing. He said, "What's uh, that's us, that's not us. And, and I think sometimes the most important things in your culture are unspoken. Like, you know, we, we, we don't need to tell our guys after we play a game, but we're going to leave the locker room better than we found it. We, we don't need to tell our guys every day that when, when we're speaking, it is with respect and understanding of who we're talking to. Um, there's so many things, I think, that, that – are a part of your culture. You don't have to, you shouldn't have to talk about every day, but I think for all of us, even our life is okay. That's us. And this is not us. And so I, you know, I I do think this, like I will share a story with you. The job before I went to Huntsville, uh, I was at Barry college, NAI school in Rome, Georgia. And we played coach Meyer at Lipscomb. We, they, we went in the league with them. And so in this, they were number one or two in the country. And it it was really an interesting dynamic. And because it was just, you know, I think the best programs are there before they get there. I mean, like just the fact I bet every high school in the city of Atlanta, which varies right outside Atlanta and North Georgia, every high school coach in his team were there because they wanted to see Lipscomb play. And the game gets going and I had a pretty good team or we had a pretty good team and it's tied with about eight minutes left. And we are playing our tail off and we're probably playing a little better than we are. We're hanging in there. And about the eight-minute mark, they had a kick and a level of commitment and toughness that we had no idea about. And, and I told our guys after that game, I said, we just got out culture. Like, they, they, they are so deep-rooted in their culture. And I, that was my second or third year at the job I had. We had no chance. Like, the bottom line was they could play harder longer than we could play harder and they could play at a high level longer than we can play at a high level. And it wasn't so much talent. It was just who they were. Great story to illustrate that for sure. And uh, I guess the other thing that shines through when, when I read any of your notes or when I've spoken to you 
is phrasing and language. It's so important to you, isn't it? And the messaging that you give to players through the language and phrasing. Can you talk about the important words? Yeah, I, I, I you know, again, I've been really fortunate to have some really uh, very smart and, and people with a lot of wisdom that have poured into my life. And I was real fortunate to get some, spend some time or a good bit of time with Coach Beeline when he was at Michigan. And he came through Huntsville recruiting a kid on my son's high school team. So we, and we were running all the two guard stuff. And, and so he was so nice and spent a lot of time with us and, and shared a lot of things. And the, the, the two things I, you know, I'm going to share three things that about him. The first thing was his humility. It, it was incredible. It was incredible. The second thing was his love of the game. Like it, I, I'll tell you a really interesting story, and then I want to share something about the language, but I think this is something that's really good for your people to hear. Uh, I guess three or four years ago, he asked if I would come up and spend a couple of days and watch practice. Well, I mean, what, I mean, like, do I, do I need to start walking now or five minutes from now? You're going, okay? And, and this one, they were really, really rolling at Michigan. And I, I, it was so nice to me. I got up there, and they're having a staff meeting. He had to step out for a minute, and he came back in with a practice plan. And, I mean, I guess Coach at the time was around 60. And, I mean, he coached. He, he's never been an assistant. And that was probably his 35th to 30, I don't know, a long time as a head coach. And he came in, and I'm telling you, he meant this, Chris. He said, I think today is the best practice plan I've ever made out. Like he said, I cannot wait to get to practice. And it, it was no – I mean, it, he meant that. And I thought, God, what passion he had just to teach. I mean, it, it was, I mean, I, I will never, I almost get goosebumps talking about it. Like he was so excited about practice and how he had put it together. But then the, other than his humility and passion for the game, the third thing was the value of language, you know, corporate knowledge within your organization and, and the way he taught offense and the way that he communicated with his kids. Like th we, we do this, I mean, like with our team now, um, not in the same way, but we've added this to us. When I walked into the film room with him, he had three things he said to them. And he, and they were like, he said, we are, and they said, Michigan. And he said, we believe in whatever, but he had three things like every day. That's how they started the, the day. When he, when like they, he right away, they knew who they were. And it was just, just the way their level of communication and the effectiveness of their language and corporate knowledge. I mean, they're, Everything they did on offense, there was a teaching point. There was a there was a there was a word association. Tremendous, tremendous, and uh, for you guys, so much of that has now evolved in your offensive communication. Right, that everything you Correct. do is basically a conceptual name. Can you talk about that? How that's helped your players and how that's helped you coach? Yeah, it, it really has been so helpful. Obviously, I'm not very smart. And when I saw what they were doing, I thought, well, maybe we can do it. And, and, I, and I think, like, for us, a lot of people ask, well, what about this? I said, we are just trying to get to the next concept. That, that's really all we're trying to do. Like, w when you talk about uh, the big picture, like, what are we trying to do schematically? Obviously, there's specific things we're looking for in the possession. But for us, we're the – Where's the ball? Where's the five man? What's the concept? That that's what we're trying to do. And we want to be able to flow into those concepts. And and but what it's done for us is just it's allowed our teaching to be more defined. Um, you know, where's the jungle? What happens when the ball goes to the jungle? And really for me, Chris, it's really helped me in game teach like corrections. I got a timeouts. I can say, okay, let's get to an Ohio to a Billy or whatever it is. And people think there's a lot to it. And, and I mean, like we, I've really worked very hard to try to streamline what we're doing, but our guys understanding our language has really helped us in games as much as anything. And, you know, coming out of timeouts and then also in the second half in front of your bench, you can just say one word and they know what concept to look to. It, it just cleans everything up. I, I say it helps us see through the fall. Take a brief moment to interrupt this podcast to share some information from one of our show supporters. As sports keep coming back, so does your chance to bet on them with our exclusive wagering partner, betonline.ag. Major League Baseball will soon be in full swing, and there are no shortage of ways to get in on the action. BetOnline has all the odds, futures, and props for you to be on. 
Also tune in as Floyd Money Mayweather Weather joins Bet Online team in a new segment called The Ice is Right, where he talks about his expansive jewelry collection. He'll give you the chance to win some great prizes and bet on the cost of his bling. Visit betonline.ag today to check out all the odds and up-to-date sports news. Don't forget to sign up and take advantage of all the Welcome Back to Sports bonuses. Bet Online, your online wagering experts. Take a brief moment to interrupt this podcast to share some information from one of our show supporters. What's the number one sign of a bad home security system? A home security system that's so complicated, you never use it. This is exactly the type of security system Please Safe has spent a decade fighting against. They believe that simply, simple is safer, and exactly why Simply Safe is the home security for right now, when feeling safe at home has never been more important. Simply Safe was designed to be easy to use while protecting your whole home 24-7. Order online with a click of a button, open the box, place the sensors, plug it in, and your home is protected around the clock. No technician or salesperson has to come and disrupt your home. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign a two-year contract. Simply Safe was named Best Overall Home Security of 2020 by U.S. News and World Report. And their 24-7 professional monitoring and emergency dispatch starts at 50 cents a day. Head to simplysafe.com slash team and get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash team to make sure they know that our show sent you. Now back to the podcast. It's great. And uh, anyone that gets a chance to uh, see you guys practice or see some of your notes and stuff, will see these words and just how uh, impactful they are and how it speeds up communication. And the other phrasing that I like that you've used, and I hope you can talk about a little bit is the ball talks. Yeah, I, I, that's a coach beeline thing. And I, I, I took so much of my offensive thoughts and mindset from, from me and Jimmy to um, you know, they both were just, I mean, they're brilliant. And um, and then Doug Novak, I've stole a ton from Doug, as you know, we all do. And um, but yet, yeah, the, I, I think for us, I, I just don't want the ball to slow down. I want ball movement, and I think for us, the best time is when we are just flowing, and we're in our default, and the ball is talking to the offense. I think for, and I think our language and our introduction of concepts and how they string together has helped us just to be able to play. Um, like it was really different for us this year at Lipscomb. Uh, we had, I, I think, the, if not the best, one of the best mid-major post players in the country, and he's a back-to-the-basket low post guy. And that's really different from what I had at Huntsville. In Division Two. I had more, guy, more guys that our, our fives were fours, and, and they, were, they were more face-up guys. We had very, very few back-to-the-basket guys. Our best back-to-the-basket guys at Huntsville were post-up guys, were, were wings that we could post. And um, – and our fives were more shooters and drivers and facilitators. And, but we would get to the point at Huntsville, we didn't get to this point this year because, you know, our team this year, we're, we're very much a work in progress. And, and, and our whole thing was whenever, I, you know, I think sometimes we get into artistic impression, like I just want a good shot. Like I, I want us to know I start with the end in mind. We want the best shot. And the best thing for us to do was throw the ball to our best player. And then we figured it out from there. But when the ball's talking, I don't think you have to make a lot of calls. And I love that. But when I was at Huntsville, we would just get in the timeout. We just hey, just keep letting the ball talk. Let it move. Let it move. Let it move. And when that when when you get ball movement, player movement with some structure, I think you're really hard to guard if it matches up with your skill set. And and you know, there I think there are times, you know, when you're struggling with flow when you have a certain guy going, there will be times we will run, you know, plays our, you know, whatever your set actions are called, but for really for us, most of our plays are just our concepts. And uh, you, I mean, your concepts and your flow and all that. And, and a lot of it comes back to how you define the difference between role players and uh, you, your best players. Can you talk about that too? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think the role guys, it's just so important. I, the kind of the, the bottom line way to share it is that role players have rules. Your best players have guidelines. Like everybody doesn't swim in the same waters. And, and I think when guys buy into that, when they understand, Hey, and Jimmy talks about this a lot is, you know, not yet. You're, you're not a guy right now that's going to get the most shots. Not yet. Like we want to get you to that point, but you're not there yet. I think at the end of the day, 
like on the night of the game, we need to make sure our best players and our team gets more good shots than their best players and their team. That, that's what we're trying to do. And so we want guys that aren't our guys that are going to be our high volume, you know, opportunity guys. They need to, we, we look for guys that can affect the game without scoring and how can they make the game easier for our best players. Like that, that's what I think a role player does. He can affect the game without having to have the ball. You know, we talk about the 95% of the rule. 95% of the time, you don't have the ball. You have to be able to affect the game without, without the basketball in your hand. And so we're looking for those guys that can make the game easy for the other guys. And, and I think the quickest way to be able to do that is can you make an open shot? You know, can, can, do you have, can you create gravity enough that they've got to stand by you, which that gives us spacing, that gives us opportunity to drive the ball. And then can, if, you, if you can make a shot and you can be a great cutter, can you know that that makes you an effective offensive player? I'm a great cutter. I'm a great shooter. You have a chance, and if you understand role definition and understand who you are with self awareness, you can help us. Absolutely, and part of the art of coaching, which which I agree with, and I've seen you say this, is to make practice fun. Can you talk about that too? The importance of making practice fun. Yeah, you know, and obviously I, I've learned a lot watching you and, and the way you set up, you know, short sided games and and just. I, you know, I, I say this a lot. I, I, I'm not good at very much, but whatever I am decent at, it was because I've enjoyed it. And everybody's idea of what's fun and not fun. I mean, we're not sitting in a, you know, we're not sitting in a circle saying kumbaya. I mean, we're not, we're not doing that. I mean, it's, you know, we work, but I don't want the guys to dread coming to practice. I don't want them to dread coming to workouts. And and at the end of the day, you're not coaching basketball you're coaching basketball players you're coaching kids and and young people and and if, if it, they don't enjoy it it's going to be really hard for them to want or to keep to keep growing you know and and we talk about the three types of kids that you can coach you can coach kids that like it you coach guys that love it and you coach kids that live it well if you want to move them through those stages I think if you have a an environment that they enjoy being in and that doesn't mean it's not challenging that's not based on toughness that it's not based on accountability those things have to exist but it doesn't have to be miserable and and so that for us is what we tried to do I, I want them to be excited about practice I want them to be disappointed when it's over well and that's the key part too is make sure that they want to come back in that way and uh you know I, I'm just, the, the other part I mean you guys play a lot of basketball in practice have you, have you always done that, or is that something that's evolved for you as a coach over your 30-plus years in coaching? Well, you know, it, it, the answer is yes and yes. We do play a lot. Um, it's not just up and down, but we do go live a lot. Um, and I have evolved more of that. Like, I actually, I had uh, breakfast with Rick Bird, Coach Bird from Belmont. Uh, he lives here in town not far from me. And we had breakfast about a month ago, and I asked him, I said, looking back on – you know, the way you taught and what you did. So what would you do differently? And he said, you know, we always play a lot of five on five. He said, I think I would play more. And I thought that was really interesting because, I mean, you talk about a guy that was the standard Trying of mid-major. Coach, yeah. Oh, and his offensive – oh, there. And, I mean, and, and, and not, not a lot of complexity, but he just talked about the importance of being able to see all 10 people on the floor, and that's how the game is played. Now, I do think there is tremendous value, tremendous value in skill development and being able to teach conceptually and break that down. But I do think at the end of the day, I probably I feel like and everybody's different. I feel like I see the game better and I can teach the game better with all 10 people out there. And Jeff Van Gundy said a similar thing on the podcast about something that he would have changed if he went back to coaching too. So I think that's something that, that definitely shines true. I mean, that's obviously part of my philosophy, but the other thing that I think is unique that you've said as well is that you approach the off season a little bit differently in that sense too, that you want players to play more pickup than more skill work in off season. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for us, I think there's a time you have to be able to take drill work into live play. Um, I actually heard I, saw, I heard Rick Majerus talk at one of Coach Myers Academies, and he talked about in the all season, like give your guys three things that they have to do in pickup. 
Like, if you have a guy that's a deficient defender, every time we play pickup, you have to guard the best player. Every time. You know, if you're a guy that is a is, is too much east-west, you're a catch-and-shoot, can't do much north and south, you have to make sure that half your shots are off the dribble or off the attack. You know, whatever that looks like. But I know I, – I think – when you can get to where you can play fast, it's because you've done it in a competitive environment. When you've done it live, when you're going live five on five, and and and, and you know, and again, everybody sees it differently. You know, I I just grew up playing so much. Like you, just, you showed up and you play. And now I was I would get there early and shoot, and I would stay late and whatever that goes into it. But for me. The way I really got to be actually pretty good laterally is I played against guys that were quicker than me. It wasn't in a drill work. It just wasn't. It, it was playing. And, and I think you figure a lot out. And, and as much for us, like if we have only eight hours in a week once we get back, part of that would just be watching our guys play pickup. I think, I think you learn so much about the mental makeup of your kids when you watch them play pickup. You, watch, you learn about their personalities. You learn about the dynamics of your team. And, and I think those are things that are really valuable information as a coach. Well, and I think there's a misnomer sometimes about p- the word pickup. So maybe let's dive into the process then for the pickup. Are, are you keeping score? There's competitiveness. Uh, are there any constraints, any type of rules, or is it just free play? No, no, no. It's going to be very first off structured. I, we, we usually try to have three teams, and, and we play a lot of cutthroat. Um, uh, we've always liked cutthroat. Um, I, I think the onus on being able to advance the ball quickly, making sure you get somebody back, playing in a fragmented floor can be there. But, but for us, like if, it's, if, we just don't, we're, if we're just playing straight pickup, we usually play to seven. Um, we do count threes um, because I think that's part of the game. We count those as twos. Um, nothing, nothing rocket science. I'm not smart enough to figure all that out, but we, we have done things where you can't, you can't win on a three, you know, you have to threes count as one, no matter what we've gone through all that, depending on how dependent we are on threes. I think learning how to defend a three is something you can say, um, that you can work on and pick up. And then, you know, one thing we really make a big deal about is they have to get back. Um, you know, if, if, if there's a situation where we get a score and you never crossed half court, then that's not counting. Like we, that you, you can't do it. If the D if, if you as the defense never got back across half court, then you, you don't get to go score on the other end. I mean, everybody's got to get to half court and, and, and we have tried to play a lot faster. And then the other thing, I know a lot of people do this, but I'm a huge believer in the importance of being able to make free throws late in the game and under pressure. Well, you have to validate every win with a free throw. You know, and, and, and working on free throw block out. Because I tell our guys every year, we're going to win or lose a game on a free throw block out. I mean, we just are. And and making that part of your pickup. And I, we, I've seen a lot of great things on pickup. And we just kind of pick and choose. I let, a lot of t- I let the assistants handle it. But I think just them being out there, and we do absolutely keep up with who wins. And, and I think that will tell you an awful lot. Like those guys – that for some reason this guy just ends up being on the winning team and there becomes a pattern that he's a winning player. We, we try to pick up on that. Yeah, no, it's, it's tremendous that you figure that out. And uh, obviously that's part of what you've talked about too, in terms of recruiting character and differentiating between, you know, character issues and maturity issues and these different things as well in your recruiting. And uh, how do you evaluate that when you're trying to, you know, decide if a player is a good fit for your team? Yeah, you know, I tell you, that's what's made recruiting really hard uh, this year for us, Chris, is I, I am so big on being able just to sit in front of a kid and talk to him. Um, I think just having the ability to see, okay, who can have a conversation, who has some it to them, that, that's one thing we, we really value. I mean, because I just think if we have the ability to have a real relationship, and, and I think for us, it's like any any relationship you're going to get into, there has to be a mutual desire for it to work. And when I watch that kid play, I look at it and say, do I want to coach him? Will, will, he, will he be somebody I would enjoy working with every day? Uh, when I talk to him, do I feel the same way? You know, uh, Coach Carrillo used to talk about light bulbs. And he would say, when you walked in the gym, 
when you saw certain kids, it was just like a light went on. You're like, I'm ready to coach. I, I say there's also dimmers. There are also guys that when you walk in, you can be in the best mood. And it's just like, they're just no fun to coach. That, that, that I, I'm not very good in that environment. And, and, and don't get me wrong. We all have shortcomings. There's things we have to work on. And I think that's what, you know, I shared a little bit about in some of the other talks is just being able to differentiate between character issues and maturity issues. Some kids, they're not bad kids. They're just not very mature, but, but we do, we really value guys that love the game. We, we say, if we can find guys that love it, our job is to teach them how to live it. And that's when you can win championships with guys that are living it. And, and then also just their character. I, we say bet on character and bet on production. Um, you know, we don't want to short, shortcut character. And we always, I, I, I do, I don't, my sisters may not agree, but I, I've all, I'm always going to value production over potential. Um, I, I just like guys that produce. I, I, there's just certain guys that get it done. And I mean, I think that's why we also look for outliers. I, I, I we don't want to be afraid to take an undersized post or a, a, maybe a guy that you might not think is the best athlete, but they just know how to play the game. I, I, I do think guys with high basketball IQ win for you. Love that. And, uh, I've always wanted to ask you a little bit about this because I know you've said it a number of times in different clinics and, and obviously you, your teams do this. So they can prepare for what you do. They can't prepare for how fast you do it. Can you talk about how you get them to play faster? Because I think a lot of coaches say it, but mm -hmm. what are the actual practical things that get you to get your team to be able to play faster? Well, I, I will say, first off, it, it's it, it, kind of going back to what we talked about a little earlier is is the importance of red shirt and kids and having kids in your program and having, a you know, a kind of a, a long term vision more than trying to be immediate in our success. It takes a lot of time. And, and like for us, if you go watch our team play at Lipscomb this year, I mean, my kids, I'm so, so proud of how well they did and everything. But there were times we were hard to watch. We were not very good offensively. We got a lot better. But and it was so unfair for me to want our guys to look like the teams at Huntsville when I'd had those guys for five years and really, and really as much as anything, 22 years of it, there's a lot of equity that goes into that. But, but I will say this, probably the thing that I am the most demanding on my guys is their cutting and our pace. Like our, our when we do, like we probably, if you scale out our practice the first 30 minutes is usually skill development slash cutting and movement offensive development and that is probably when I'm the most demanding and the most intense is because I, I just think they just that that has to be their mindset our pace has to be better than the defense's ability to keep up with it we say we want to be we want to be one picture ahead the whole time like we want to be one pass ahead. We want to get the advantage and not give it back. And, and I know a lot of people do say it, and, but that for us is just every day just doing the same things. I, I think you have to be careful a lot of times. You can misinterpret activity for accomplishment. Just because we got a lot of running around don't mean we're getting a lot done. We want to be intentional and we want to be demanding when it comes to our, our pace that we do every single thing evolves our offense and our movement. And, uh, and it speaks to this other point that you made that uh, only the fools think it's in the strategy. Oh, <laughs> love that. <laughs> oh, it, it's the, I'm, I'm just telling you, you, you just, it, it, there's so much. The, the, the first thing is it is a player's game. It, it, if you think, I, I think one of the great, you know, they said coach Meyer, they had a great story here. Our athletic director, Philip Hutchinson, who's incredible was was the all-time leading scorer in the history of college basketball until the guy that succeeded him became the all-time leading scorer in the history of basketball, college basketball. And they were both post players for Coach Meyer and played here at Lipscomb. And, and, and Coach Meyer came back um, towards the end of his life and shared with the coaches. And one of the coaches asked him, he said, what would be if you could look back and say, I, I probably missed this. I probably uh, maybe overestimated that. And he said, he, he said, at the end of the day, you can't out coach people. And, and his point was, don't ever think you're going to go in and you're going to turn a team with not as much talent into a championship team. He said there was times, you know, because you would watch your teams play and they weren't the most talented. 
Now he could, I mean, I, he, I, he said there was a lot of humility. I thought he outcoached everybody. But at the end of the day, if you think you're going to outcoach people now the way that um, technology is, I mean, like Chris, I, I was looking at some, some of your stuff getting ready for this. Like there was like six things I saw last night and I'm like, we could do that. Like if we need a basket, that's a great action for us. Because of tech's not, technology now, there's no secrets to this stuff. It's just there's none. And, and so I think it's all about the buy-in and relationships and your players. And so I, I just don't think you're going to out-strategize a bunch of guys. I just don't. Well, and speak to that, Coach, because it's such such a valuable point for all of us to remind ourselves if we know it and obviously if we don't know it, to learn it. But can you speak to that on an actual in an actual game situation? How does that thinking help you coach better? Well, I think one thing it's similar to our players. I think when we, I tell our guys, we want to be, we want to have, a, we want to play with emotion without being emotional. And, and, and I think you need to coach the same way. I, I think, like I've watched you instruct, and I watch your teams play, and when you guys are rocking and rolling, and I'm like. There is such a – you knew what you were looking for. Like, I, I, I think it's so important going into every game you say, these are the things that we have to do to have a chance to win the game, okay? But then I also think that you don't need to be afraid to think outside the box because I, I think there's some things I, – I, I don't think you – I don't think any team is ever great at everything. And so for us – like if we can find one thing that maybe can turn the game just a little bit, if it's a change in defense, if it's a just doing something that, that you just know there's no way they've prepared for that. And because there's such a fine line to winning. And, and for us, I, I, I think just understanding once we have our plan, we need to stay the course as long as we can, but don't be afraid to do something different just because you're worried about what other people are going to think. Like I, I I think that's a real weakness in coaches and, and and me at the front of this list. Like if I found out you were coming to watch my practice in October, Chris, because I have so much respect for you and everything you've done, like every coach, I want you to come and say, wow, boy, they really know what they're doing. Well, that's, that's not even possible in October. Like that, that that's absolutely not, not. Yeah. that's not even possible. And so why, why get caught up in that and, and, and just make sure that if you're going to tell your guys control what you can control, then you need to be the guy that, that, that creates the boundaries for that and, and say, you know what, we, it, it really, at the end of the day, it's about us and our guys in our circle and making sure we have a plan, we stick to it as long as we can, but don't be afraid to go off script because of your ego. I mean, and that's a product of having coached a lot of games too, where you get that comfort in knowing that you can go off script. And uh, that's one of the challenges that I know you've talked about is how – how many coaches coach their first game with, you know, at a high level without ever having been a head coach previously, right. It's Instead really, of having those reps. It's really hard. Like, I, you know, actually I had a conversation with Doug this morning and he was talking about, he did a little clinic for families that was social distance this weekend. And he said, I just need practice coaching. Like he said, I need to practice being on the floor with people. I heard Stan Van Gundy, uh, who's been really nice to me, he talked about somebody asking, like, how are you so good out of timeouts and sideline out of bounds? And he said, quite honestly, it's just I've done it a long time. You know, yeah. it, it's just, you know, the, the old outlier, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. Um, and but but I think within that, though, Chris, I think you have to be really careful to think you got this whole thing figured out. I heard Larry Schott say one time, the three most dangerous words for any coach is I got this. And I, I, I think we all have to work so hard hard every day just to continue to evolve you know I say keep stay one step ahead of the posse and it it, it, it but it's I think sometimes we want to be somewhere that's just not realistic to get there and 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 just so for us understanding everything that's really good takes time and and you know it does help the longer you do it but I think as much as anything just knowing who you are just self-awareness is such a big part of coaching such a great point and that you know, I got this mentality balanced with the fact that sometimes you feel like, man, 
I, I'm not, I don't have any of this. I'm not a very good coach. And that still goes through our heads, doesn't it? Like that never leaves sometimes that both that humility and then that confidence and blending that together. No, and, and, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I say it usually at every time I talk, and I'm sure people have heard me a couple of times get tired of hearing it, but there are two types of coaches, those, those that are humble and those that are about to be. And I'm telling you, there were some times, and, and every year I've gotten this way, but there were times this year I was like, I, I, I need to be doing anything else other than coaching basketball. And Because I, I promise you right now I have more questions about the game than I've ever had. Like, I, I, I just like every time I hear somebody I think is a really good coach, I'm like, I've never thought about that. Like, how dumb am I? You know, I just and, – and we all struggle with that. But that's where I think you have to make sure your circle is tight and they are loyal and with you. You know, like that's what I talk about, just the importance of hiring the right staff, you know. Like, just making sure that those guys have the quality – that the qualities you're looking for, because there were many times this year, I was really doubting myself and my guys, because they're just high character, they're competent, they challenge, but they also are committed to us and our program and me. Like they said, we're going to be okay, coach. Just got to keep going. We just got to keep going. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it's like this. I, I, I said this to somebody the other day. I said, the minute you start thinking somebody else has got the perfect life, you don't know them very well. I, I promise you that we all have doubts. And, and if you don't have doubts, at some point, you're going to get hit right in the mouth. Coach, oh, couldn't have said it better. Uh, that is the process. And uh, you've won over 500 games, and you still go through that. And uh, that's, that's part of this process of coaching. And definitely, it's the art side. Because if it was all science, we would all have the answer. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it is. And you know what? But that's what's fun. You know, like that's the fun part is trying to figure it all out. And, you know, and every year is so different. I mean, I don't care if you've got your same 12 kids back, next year is going to be different. And every year takes on a life of its own. And, and, and like what I always talk to our guys about is just, I want to paint this vision for you. I want to, I want to put this out there, but we all have to do it in our own way. And, and like, don't assume that every, this is just the way it's going to be. I mean, there's so many times that you think, okay, we're moving in the right direction and it goes off course or things are going south. And, and I think you have to be careful not to overreact. I, I, I just think that it, it, it's a challenge. It, you know, winning is hard, but God, what a great opportunity we have. I mean, there's just something about basketball that gets you. And I know that's what it did for me. And just being a part of a team and having a chance to, to help people and, and just shared suffering. Just a lot of it is shared suffering. Coach, this has been amazing. Uh, so many great insights and uh, maybe just, do you have any final thoughts to be able to share with us as coaches? Yeah, I, I think, and I say this probably at the end of most times I get a chance to share with people. I, I think we all need to understand this is a tough profession and we need, good people who truly love the game and care about kids involved in it. And I think the thing that would help that as much as anything is coaches learning how to take care of each other, you know, just being there. And, you know, it's amazing how many texts and phone calls you get when you get a big win, but when you get on the bus after a tough loss and there's nothing, that's hard, you know? And, and so I think a lot of times us just being able to enter other people's world and, you know, knowing you got a buddy that, man, I know he's going through a tough time. Well, you, you don't need to be bashing him. You need to be in doing whatever you can to try to help him. And for guys that have done it for a long time, you know, looking for guys that you can mentor and, and just encourage because, I mean, I mean, it's always remember, but for, for, for the grace of God, go I. I mean, it, there's so many guys that have had bad breaks in this business that were great people and, you know, don't ever, don't ever think you got this thing figured out and that you're not going to need other people because I promise you you're going to. And, but, uh, no, at the end of the day, Chris, thank you so much for what you do for the game. My level of respect is through the roof of you. And, and believe me, those aren't just words. That is sincere. And I, you challenge me every time I have a chance to watch anything that you put out. Well, thank you for that, Coach, and thanks for sharing the game with us. Uh, just tremendous. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to getting uh, back with you at some point to be able to dive even deeper into some of the other things that you do so well. And, uh, Coach, I, sorry, I, I do, did remember there's one thing I wanted to ask because I posted this and I thought you saw it. 
is when you put five players out of bounds to inbound versus pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you talk about that just quick? Yeah, we call it football, yeah. and uh, and what we do, we usually have a number, and that's the guy, who, whatever his position, he's the guy that's going to run the down and out. Everybody else is on just a dead sprint. I will tell you this, though, Chris, and this is really interesting, and I think it was missed in our game. W- official told me he watched that. We did it three times at the end of one of our games, yeah. and he said, now you realize you can't do that if it's not after a made basket. And I didn't know that. Maybe I don't know if he was right or wrong. But so if so, if I was going to do it, to make sure you know, okay. If you couldn't gonna, do it on a dead ball, he's saying? That's what he said. And I don't know if he's right or wrong. I, mean, he, they pay, I know we write him a lot of big checks to referee our games. <laughs> um, but he said uh, that you couldn't do that. And I said, well, we'll just put their heels, you know, on the baseline then. I think yeah. it's the same concept. I think any time that you can run hard in a straight line, it is really hard to deny that guy the ball. Like, I, I just think anytime you're running in short, concise, we want to make sh- short, concise cuts. And if you run in the, if they know what's going to happen before it happens, that's the guy that's going to get open. Um, and, and, I, and I will say there's nothing foolproof, but I will tell you, we have always been able to get the ball in doing that. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I, I've used it before and, uh, you know, in, in a different way than the way I saw you guys do it. But uh, I loved it. Great. Glad I remembered to ask you about that. Sure. Thanks again, Coach. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game and to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion. Subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.